Now, some people will get scared, fear mm-hmm. of asking for help because, oh my God, I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. Damn, man, get put your ego aside. Mm-hmm. Put your damn ego aside. Ask for help and figure out, okay, can you help me? Like, I haven't done this before. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Let's get paid at the same time. Hello and welcome back, everybody. This is the DC Talks podcast. I am your host, Ono Sende, as they call me, Agent Double O. We're back here for episode 20 with the DC himself. DC, how are you doing today, man? I'm good. I just uh, wonder who actually calls you that. I, every episode, I think. You we know, the thing is, it's... It's, when I become like someone, like one day, like of, yeah. of status, it'd be like the Double O. So, so you're just, you're starting my podcast with a lie. I mean, it's not a lie. I mean, I you have said friends. One, you said, who, you, you actually, well, first of all, there's another lie. You have friends. So are you trying to Elon Musk me the way he was doing the BBC <laughs> reporter? <laughs> uh, I'm doing very well, as you You're can doing see. Very yeah, well. I'm doing very well. You, you had me on the edge of my seat, man. <laughs> you had me on the edge of my seat. But, uh, you know, today we had a really good conversation in episode 18. We're talking about, you know, staying true in a changing world. And at the core of that, I hope people uh, ex- <laughs> didn't get too upset with that one. But hopefully, uh, you might have rubbed people the wrong way. But at the end of the day, you're staying true to who you are and keeping it real. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the key things that I noticed was a trend in that is the fear that exists in people when they want to say something, but they can't say it because they feel like how they're going to be looked up on people who are their friends or people who they work with. Of course. That holds them back. So when we comes to fear, like how much do you think of it is in our own heads versus actually something that's actually existing in true reality? <laughs> I think most of it's in your head, buddy. Mm-hmm. Fear is it can be crippling, you know, fear can be, I don't know, mind numb. It it can encompass most of your life if you're worried about stuff. You know, fear can be, can be, like I said, can take over your whole life. If you're scared to go outside, you've seen those people are like, oh, is it argophobics? Is that, am I saying that right? The what? The ones that are, the the fear of going outside, I forget the name, like it literally can take over um, your whole. FOMO? No, it's, and then it's it. Fear, fear uh, whatever it's called. Yeah. No, that's FOMO. I'm saying people actually fear of going outside. They literally say inside. Anyway, my point is that fear can be, you know, it could be a driver for some people too. I use fear to help drive me because I get worried and stuff too. But most people don't use fear that way. Mm-hmm. Most people, it, it become, it can be crippling and mm. it's getting over that fear of realizing like, shit, man, what is this actually doing? You know, mm-hmm. get out of your own head because like, that's, that's what fear is. Fear is the anticipation of what might happen, not what's actually happening. Yeah. There's one quote by Will Smith. He said, who? Uh, Will Smith. Who's that? Will Smith. Big Willie style. I have no Fresh idea Prince. who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You didn't know who Roseanne Barr was. I, I, of course, I know who Will Yo, Smith. Honestly, is. you cannot, you cannot get on me about Rose. I genuinely don't know who that, is, who that was. <laughs> a white woman. That's why. Eh? Is, that, is that what we're going here? I only deal with black women. That's it. That's it. That's my style, man. <laughs> All right, buddy. I'm Just sorry. Like, what, I like what, my coffee, bro. What did, what did uh, Mr. So Will Smith? Mr. Will, Mr. Will Smith was saying, you know, the things, the fears that we're born with are the fear of falling and the fear of a loud sound. Everything else is like we created in our own heads. So well, there's also the fear of slapping people in there. I felt like it was pretty bold. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine yeah. someone just comes up to you and just slaps you, bro. Like yeah. depending on where I might like it. What would you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, man. You see, man. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I, I, somebody slapped me in the face. I don't know. I, like I've had that before, I guess, but people you probably know, but I don't know. I don't know. If, there's competitions out there. How many you can take a slap, right? So I'm seeing those competitions, like like legit, it's an actual sport. Yeah, being slapped. And oh, it's unreal. I see some of those guys' faces are yeah, like this. It's like just like guys get knocked up. out. Damn. Yeah. There's one chick who got slapped so hard. She fell over and she did like a somersault. She was falling. Damn. <laughs> There's this new competition where the girls are trying to, they're wearing like these, it's like in Brazil or something with the G string, the slapping ass. <laughs> I go, okay, all right. I'm like, all right, I'll watch this for a couple of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's all my wife catches me, I guess. No. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry. I <laughs> I'm just getting that where we're going. We're yeah. talking about fear and slapping. Fear slapping ass and yeah. everything like Again, that. Again, that's why it all depends where like what university we used to like and get drunk and slap each other all the time. And we just get bruised all over asses and legs and stuff too. And so it's like, I'm used to that. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's actually, actually in hockey culture too. Yeah, right? we're not. Like, hockey, just, we're, we're just sick individuals. Slap that ass, man. That's what Slap that ass. Slap like, that ass. Slap. Man. I remember one time waking up and, uh, in university and I'm like, and 
And I'm like, what the hell? Like, why can I not sit down? Mm-hmm. I took, I, and I didn't remember we drank so much the night before mm-hmm. and it's like a homecoming or something. And I literally turned in the mirror and my from my back to my leg was black. Black, black. Black, black. Like black like me. <laughs> yeah, black like <laughs> It hurt, man. It was, yeah. yeah. Like when you don't have the, the alcohol running through your veins, you can really feel it at the yeah. next day. Yeah, you feel the reality of the pain now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so some of those slap competitions, damn, like, like if that hurt, like That's my face point. my ass didn't go out like this, but those guys' faces like this, could yeah. you imagine walking out in public and you're like, that? Oh. And what's it for too? Like what's like the end no idea. That. You know, like you can slap some of the hardest. It just well, what's what, what's a sport? Just like mm-hmm. boxing, I guess, MMA mm-hmm. or arm wrestling. Yeah, yeah. more like arm wrestling because you're not gonna. No, those guys That's aren't gonna strength. make a lot of money. Yeah, but like slapping someone too on that thing is just like okay, you slap someone. There's no finesse. There's no skill. It's just. Hit oh, I would disagree. I think there's a lot well, of. Fin- oh yeah, and my hands are pretty heavy too. So we used to slap it like it's mm. it's. There's a lot of technique. You can also like grow some calluses on the middle of your hands, right? And like I got calluses. Like, yeah. like you're lifting, eh? Yeah, I'm staying in shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Try sure. to, try to. But I'm like, going back- be with you, my friend. You're like what half my age. I mean, I'm 29. <laughs> so yeah, yeah so. 15 years. I got your senior. So yeah. yeah, and you just turned 45 too, man. Yeah, you know so. At 45 right now. You love seeing my age, eh, lately? Yeah, I'm like, what's wrong with that, bro? Like, I thought, <laughs> I thought you are a young buck. <laughs> no, I don't mind it. I don't mind. I don't mind being 45. Like I said, I'm, I'm halfway through 90. And I'm like, I'm at least going to make it to 90 is my point. So yeah, yeah. at least that's that's my mentality. No fear of dying Still young. Still looking good, though. Thanks, brother. Exactly. So, you know, you turning a new chapter, right? I'm going to say that just to, like, make it feel comfortable. Okay. Um, as you look ahead, do you feel like the fears you had perhaps when you are younger compared not as you're older those things change like what kind of things do you when you look forward ahead when you think about your family and all the things going on in your life how do you approach those certain fears now as you approach a different age each year yeah so when you're younger it's more of your fear it's it's pretty much egotistical Mm -hmm. you know what am i going to do with my life you know where i'm going to be like i'm I'm scared i'm going to be alone those kinds of things um you know, am I going to be a failure? Is my family going to respect me? Those kinds mm-hmm. of things, like your parents and your uncles, aunts, those kinds of things. Once you're, you know, established, I kind of once you have a family, it's different. It's now it's like, am I going to be able to feed my family? Uh, are they going like, to am I raising them correctly? But my my fear, you know, if we get into it too, like we with religion and things like that, like we've we've had a transition to more of Christianity, so. You know, my kids don't go to like a Catholic school like we do. And like, I'm fear that, okay, are they going to miss out on some of the teachings we learned as children, as, as children throughout our adult life? Uh, am I, you know, I pray to God, am I, you know, give me the, I'm fear that I've, that I am not raising them the true Catholic, a true, true Christian way. Like, and I'm fear that they're going to not know, have a relationship with God. Those are kinds of things I fear it's different than it was, right? Mm-hmm. My fears are, other than the God one, the ones that they fill with life, it's like that, that those turn to drivers. I think actually the one with God too, I guess they're all drivers to make mm-hmm. sure I'm, you know, on track and I'm being the best dad, father, human I possibly can. Mm-hmm. Right. So from what it sounds like your fears are now becoming more external than internal. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because I'm very, you have and, more responsibility. Yeah. And, I, and also throughout the years and through success, you get to, you, not an ego, but you get more confident in who you are mm-hmm. uh, and accepting challenges, which in the past would have scared the shit out of me, mm-hmm. you know, going door knocking before used to scare the shit out of me. And then I, after the first couple of doors, just like you get comfortable in it after a while. So I got comfortable with facing fears, I guess you would say. Um, and I still like, even to this day, when something's unknown, you, you, you get a, like a feeling. It doesn't manifest as a pit in my stomach. You just kind of like, it's more in my head and I'm like, okay. And then I think about it, like, okay, how can I tackle it? So whereas maybe 20 years ago, I mean, that's maybe even longer than that. Maybe when I was younger, you know, maybe 15, 20 would have been crippling. I would have thought about it and like, it would give me knots in my stomach and I couldn't go out and it would affect my hockey game. It would just affect my social life. It would just, the fears were just, just, it, it, it was not, it, they didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. But the fear was they used to cripple me at some point. And I know now it's different, right? But mm-hmm. then you go through the fears. I'm like, oh my God, it didn't kill me. And it's true. If what doesn't, you know, doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And then realize the point of like, why are you worried about this shit? Like, mm-hmm. screw it, right? Just move forward. Yeah. Face it and let's go. You know, things seem difficult until you realize they're not. And a lot of the things that you do, it could be the same thing as you're saying, the door knocking. 
It could be cooking that meal, whatever it is. Cooking a meal scares you? Let's say if it's like a meal that you were so scared to make it because you're just, you know, what I'm trying to say is. That, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to nitpick on that. I, I get what you're saying. I'm trying yeah. to say until you like get through the motion of actually making the the, the meal. Um, before back you to the meal, eh? You're back to the meal. You, you're measuring everything. <laughs> now you're just maybe picking out salt. You're just dashing. You kind of have an intrinsic sure. feeling of like what to do. So um, those fears, um, there's a quote or the acronym that goes about fear is like false evidence appearing real. So it's actually not the reality of what actually exists out there, but it's actually just something that you made up in your head. Mm -hmm. And then when you do it, you're like, wow, this is actually way easier than I thought it was going to be. Like building that business is a lot easier than what I thought it was going to be. And I think everything is always just a mirage because when we look at grandiose things, you have a feeling of, can I, can I do it? That seems impossible. Sure. They're able to do it. How can I not do it? And then you go and make that attempt. Then you realize that, okay, this could have probably been done even sooner if I hadn't mm -hmm. just not been scared and went and did it. Well, that's it's the same thing we've talked to. Uh, I've said to you in the past with about realtors and when they're starting the business. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you know, like just because you don't know how to do something, don't say no to the business. Don't mm -hmm. say no. Take it, take on the challenge. And like people are just scared and crippled. I mean, come talk to somebody. Uh, I'll give you an example, like two examples recently. Like I had never done like a, a business purchase, mm -hmm. right? One of my clients called me up and said, Hey, Dave, like, do you do this? I'm like, Well, I haven't before, but I'll figure it out. And, you know, I talked to my good friends, Chris Kuko coach who used to do commercial. We sat down, we created it. It wasn't difficult. I just needed some guidance. Like, okay, like this is what you do for residential, this for purchase. How do we, and it was simple. We kind of talked about like, let's do this. We just talked it out. It was fairly easy and to, to figure out, to make sure we protected our clients. And the deal happened so quickly and everybody was happy. And the lawyer said, you did a great job. So that gave me reassurance that again, something of fear in the beginning, I'm like, shit, how do I do this? And now it's like, no, it's easy enough to do. Another time was with Julia the other day, like hopefully she doesn't mind me talking about her. She's behind me. Um, but again, she was doing a commercial lease and and we were just, I was telling her kind of things to do. And again, you could see it or like in her eyes, she was a little scared about it. I'm like, let's just sit down. Let's, and I did the same thing for her as Chris did for me. And I think at the end of the day, once you do one and you got also have some guidance or so it's, it's not something to be scared about and just to walk away from. So yeah, you can, so that's just a small snippet of what could happen in your business. But if we were completely scared shitless of that, mm -hmm. like we wouldn't even ask for help. We're like, that could have been like, you know, thousands of dollars out of our pockets Yeah, for like, for not, not a crazy amount of work. It's not like we have to do manual labor for this thing. You're writing up a document, mm -hmm. which we're familiar with documents doing exactly the same thing we do. It's just making sure the words were right and you're scared yeah. of the words. Yeah, it looks like a grandiose, this right? monster that you got to take on. Yeah. But once you just follow it step by step and you do it even more and more, you're like, oh man, this is cakewalk. Yeah, it's absolutely, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's a cakewalk because you just got to make sure you protect your clients. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like literally, I think at the end of the day, I think we're, we're all better off kind of doing going through that fear and saying, mm -hmm. okay, so next time I might still ask help. Julia will probably mm -hmm. still ask my help again just to make sure we got everything down packed. I'll probably talk to Chris anytime there's commercial stuff or, you know, that we don't do every single day. Again, doesn't mean we can't do it. It's always good to have a second set of eyes to say, hey, did I do this correctly? There's nothing wrong with that. Now, some people will get scared, fear mm -hmm. of asking for help because, oh my God, I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. Damn, man, get... Put your ego aside. Mm -hmm. Put your damn ego aside. Ask for help and figure out, okay, can you help me? Like, I haven't done this before. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Let's get paid at the same time. There's this thing uh, where people feel they've got to qualify their question, right? They say, this might sound like a stupid question. Why, why, why do you got to qualify and say, this is a stupid question? Why not just ask the question? <laughs> and it goes into that whole fear of criticism that yeah. we're talking about, right? There is... A culture going back to like the council culture and everything where we've developed this thing where if we ask a question it's seen as dumb or you should know that or which holds people back from actually thinking what they're saying and it's not silly like don't we need to change that culture and, and we did it in school too right especially like when you're in uni or public or high school or something people don't want to raise their hands and ask something because they're afraid of what people are going to think around them well, that's one of the things. Uh, and other times people just don't care. <laughs> Maybe the other reason. People but, forget. Yeah. People have things to worry about. Like, yeah. I don't care about what you're thinking or what you're going to ask because you find a lot of people, they're thinking, I got to pay that phone bill. I got to feed my kids. I got to think about what I'm going to do to work tomorrow. So when you really look at things like that, people don't really care about what you're, what you feel or mm -hmm. what you're thinking about what you're asking. So that fear is 
totally irrelevant to what you actually are doing and what actually exists in reality. Yeah. Well, I, I find with every quote unquote fear that we have these days, all those ones you just listed, they're, yeah, man, like losing a home, all the kind of, because you're worried about mortgage payments. Like there's, there's tons of fears that could be out there, how you're going to feed your family, but there's also solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and at some point, if you continue to give into your fear and not ask the questions and how to figure this out, it's just going to get worse. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, people might be struggling to make a mortgage payment now with the interest rates going up instead of, instead of freaking out, like, what can we do? Like, talk to people, talk to mortgage brokers, talk to a realtor. Like, how do we solve this issue? If you don't come to us because you're really scared about what the future might hold, well, that's not helping your situation. So we got to start having communications. And that comes long, that goes further than this, right? That's not just, you know, in business. You know, I had a friend of mine, um, Earlier this year, I think we don't know if we talked about this podcast who who uh, killed himself, unfortunately. No way. And um, yeah, great guy, one of our captains, fantastic guy. Um, you don't know what the fear is going on because he nobody knew. He didn't talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. Again, we're not saying that this is would have been solved a hundred percent by talking, but if you're having mental health, and that's I've, I've I've said this on my videos many times. Like I think the fear of reaching out because they don't want to be seen as something. They want to be seen as weak. Weak or and then too, right? Or they feel like they want to be a burden. I've heard that a lot of times for people who've tried to commit suicide. Like, I didn't want to be a burden on people anymore because they're fearing that what they would feel like. So they're drowning in their own misery. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not helping anybody. Mm-hmm. Anytime you fear, like the other thing is when you orate a fear, you're like, oh, is that all it is? When you're talking to somebody else and you're like, you kind of make you sit back and you're like, oh, okay. When I say it out loud. It doesn't seem as daunting as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like I, I approach fear very, very differently now. It's even like when, um, you know, growing up as young guys, you and your boys are like, oh, go talk to that girl. Yeah. Okay. Holy right? God, yeah. Go. <laughs> you remember those days before yeah. you were married, right? You're like, go talk to her. And the physiology of your whole body just crams up. And you really think about it. You, know, you sit back and you're like, damn, it's just another human being. But I'm building up this entire whole scenario in my head, thinking that they're this monster. They're gonna say something bad about me. They're gonna. Well, there's whole movies written about this kind of stuff of our fears, and we all love those movies because we all remember what it was like. Yeah. Yeah, man. But you know, once you do a couple of approaches, and then you get a couple of rejections, you just kind of feel like, ah, like this is all I'm scared about. Like it's just a girl. Like yeah. she was pretty nice, but she's probably not feeling me. Doesn't mean like another girl's yeah. not gonna like me. But yeah. that whole idea of just approaching strangers, especially amongst men is something that I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like a fear of rejection. Maybe it's a fear of just mm-hmm. looking bad in front of your boys. Like, so there's a pride aspect on it. It's like a whole different thing. But I've, from my experience, I've found out by doing multiple approaches and also just being in sales too. It's built like this whole skin around me that nothing can really bring me down. We are fortunate not everybody gets to that place, right? Like, it's, But, you know, DC, I wasn't born like that. No, no, you know absolutely. It took a lot of work to get there. It took a lot of... Uh, it took a lot of practice, took a lot of reps. And that's what I, th- what I think is like when you're talking about Julia too and what she's doing, that fear is going to be gone po- possibly after her third rep of doing that whole procedure again. Mm-hmm. So it goes to question like, is fear just all about reps and doing something? Maybe reps and attempting to build a business, being a great realtor, mm-hmm. that it just embodies you over time and you realize there's nothing really to be scared about. So like, what is Well, well one thing I do like about fear, let's say it too, it, the fear of it also gets you out of your comfort zone, mm. right? Uh, my coaches in the past have said this, and I say this too, like you're only going to grow outside your comfort zone. Yeah. So you, fear is actually seen as opportunity. Mm. On that, like, have you felt as if you are fearful of your own success? Because it's fear of not achieving things, but sure, sometimes people can be afraid of what they could become. And it actually stops them from actually doing it. So there's a quote that was like, you know, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear, for all the Coach Carter fans out there, you know what quote I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, Shout out to Timo Cruz, yeah. um, all them man, you know. Our deepest fear is not inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. So you can feel, and I think this is what actually brings people down from actually trying something, is that they're afraid of, doing it and actually becoming a light that shines so bright that they're actually shining more than the people around them. So they actually just want to keep themselves to where everybody's at. I don't know too many people like that. <laughs> they would think that. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
So I would see it this way. I, I think I look at it differently though, in the sense, surprise, surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, I find if you get to that level where you can shine, well, you're shining light on somebody else. You can also make them shine as well, mm-hmm. right? It gives you something else. If you're helping people, you could make them shine even brighter than yourself. And you, you would take some comfort in that. So instead of hiding that, you know, who are you helping by hiding mm-hmm. in, your, in your success, right? You know, and, and in the Italian culture, we used to always like, or at least our family, they're always worried about like, they say malocchio, like, you know, evil eye. If you get too successful, you know, people will put curses on you and you have to do all these things. You can't be both. I, I, maybe that's where my lack of boastful, I don't, I don't think I have a big ego. I don't go around saying, look how great I am. But at the same time, it's like, I want to get, continue to be successful and show other people how to get that way because it helps all of us, I think, as a culture, I think, as 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 an industry. So one of the reasons why I didn't want to be a realtor, we've talked about this in the past, is I went through, you know, my brother-in-law was great when I'm dealing with him as a realtor, but the prior to that, I had some really bad realtors that I went through, like really bad, to the point where I didn't want to associate with that. Well, if I continue to shine and I can help other realtors, maybe that helps elevate our business, right? So Imagine I got to a level and I didn't help anybody, right? And I just hid my success or lack thereof. I don't know, maybe I, I think I'm, I do all right for myself. But what if I hid that and I wasn't, say I didn't bring anybody else on or I wasn't oh, like my a Royal Page signature. Mm-hmm. I go, we talk, uh, we do these round tables. People ask us questions. I give them information. I, I'm trying to help. Well, what if I had that success because I didn't want people to know about it and I did help that other those other realtors. Mm-hmm. T- to me, that's not giving back. Like mm-hmm. to me, that's, way worse mm-hmm. than not letting other people see your shining star. Mm-hmm. Well, screw that. It's, it's, um, no, you definitely make a lot of sense. I try to. And, uh, oh, you, you know, <laughs> maybe six out of 10 times. You yeah. <laughs> so 60% of the time it works the time. every <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a lot of people, like, especially when you're in a group with people you've come up with, people you grew up with, and now you're trying to, you know, level up. There could be some envy there. There could be. But some- how are you leveling up? Am I leveling up by driving really nice cars and flashing it for them? Or am I leveling up, you know, wearing nice clothes and saying, hey, this is, look, asshole, this is what I got? Yeah, if you do that, you're a douchebag. It, it's the mentality of, I don't want to make you feel as if, like, I am now trying to leave the group. Wait a second. I had this with my brother too. Like, yeah. you know, I used to go to the salon and I remember the first time I had a nice pair of Prada. He goes, you can't wear those in my store. I'm like, why? Well, he goes, well, Everyone's gonna be worried, like, say how much money we ha- you have and all this stuff too. And like in my store, they're gonna. Say, I'm like, I can't. Well, now you're telling me I, I make money and I can't buy nice things. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I, uh, screw that. I'm like, I'm, uh, I, I'm not going around flashing it. I'm not doing that too. But I'm like, I'm entitled to like not mm-hmm. a title, but I've earned some money. If I want to buy a nice pair of shoes, let me buy a nice pair of shoes. Like, why do you have to try to bring down my thunder? I did. Mm-hmm. I actually forgot I was wearing them. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't like. And so just a different mentality, even with their own family, we're looking at each other. Like we look at things way differently, like, mm-hmm. way differently. So you're wearing Prada shoes, eh? I own a few pair of Prada shoes. Looking fly all the time, DC. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why is this conversation going there, buddy? I was just asking. Well, this. if you know something about me, I love my shoes. Okay. Okay. How many, every time you come here, I always have a different pair of shoes. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, I like yeah. my Jordans. I like my Gucci's. I like my Pradas. Yeah. I have a couple of pairs of YSLs and stuff too. That's the, I just like nice shoes. You like nice things. And the one thing I've noticed, and I've learned this from Rich Dad Port, I believe it was, he's like, oh no, it was another one. Uh, the millionaire, the difference of millionaires, but, uh, one of the habits they had is like millionaires tend to buy really nice shoes, mm-hmm. but because they last a long period of time. Mm-hmm. If you buy a hundred dollar pair of shoes and they only last a season, but you buy a thousand dollar pair of Gucci's that last 15, 20 years, who's actually better off? Are you better off buying a hundred dollar pair of shoes for the next 10 years? Or are you better off buying one pair of shoes, which lasts you, which you can mold and continue to wear for longer than the 10 years? Who's the dumb one in that situation? hundred dollars. Of course, because yeah. you're paying, and and it's going to increase every year. Mm-hmm. So what's a hundred dollars at the end of like say maybe ten years? You're paying two hundred dollars. So you're almost paying way more than I paid for my thousand dollar shoes. Of course, well just stay fly. You know I I respect that about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you touched upon something interesting earlier. We're talking about as you are maturing now. You're you know moving to a different stage of your life. You have a lot more external fears, and uh, pre a couple episodes before we spoke about the loss of your of your dad um oh great don't start don't make me cry again <laughs> man <laughs> don't, i don't want to okay. make you cry but okay. i'm All just right. curious you know after suffering such a loss did you develop a fear of losing other people around you no um 
and it's weird I say no because I I took it a different way again. I I tried to make sure that when I passed away, what was I passing on? So I looked internally at that point. Mm-hmm. And and I say to my kids all the time, if I die tomorrow, what would this be? I'm like, I, I looked at it, me not losing somebody else, but them losing me. Mm-hmm. So by looking internally, trying to find to make sure, like again, I, I wasn't a realtor at that point when my dad passed away. I was just, I wrote my first exam four days after he passed away. We were supposed to be doing real estate together. And I didn't realize how many people I could help. So it turned more of my focus, again, about being selfish and turning it around. I think that helped. I think that helped me be better. Mm-hmm. Actually, even at my dad's funeral, you'd be surprised how many people came up to us and said, your dad helped me with this. Your dad helped me. He never said anything to us. We didn't know. I had no idea how many people my dad, like we had random people like, yeah, your dad was doing this. And I'm like, it gave me comfort knowing that. So I wasn't, I'm not fear. I'm, I try to enjoy the people that are in my life now because you never know. So maybe look at it that way. So try to cherish maybe a little bit more every single day who you're with. Try to make sure that those relationships are enhanced and mm-hmm. acceptable. Don't get me wrong. We're not perfect like yeah. this. And there's, you know, to say me and my wife don't fight all the time or like, well, not all the time. We don't fight or have arguments that we love and cherish every moment. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But we do appreciate it more because I think about it too. And it's like, I could lose you. You could lose me. Like how, how is it going to affect other people when I pass away? If I get hit by a car tomorrow, what's my legacy going to be? Like, will, will there be positive impact on people or negative? Mm-hmm. And by my dad dying the way he was, we got to see a little bit more into the character we already knew he had, but how many people he touched was just, it was touching. It was beautiful. So I wanted to carry that on. Now you're thinking more about legacy that you're going to be leaving behind. What what does that look like to you? What's my legacy when I leave? Yeah. What do you want it to be when you leave? It's a good question. I think my legacy is when I is, he was an awesome guy, brightened up the room, made me laugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you ever need anything, I was able to help any way I possibly can, whether, you know, financially or friends or for somebody else that was, Somebody I can go with my problems and help and somebody that can help me. I think that means the most to me that I was there to help and help guide any way I possibly can. Mm-hmm. That's my legacy. I don't, you can't take the money with you. It gives a shit about the money. Hey, legacy is greater than currency. It's, that's a good one. Do you know uh, my buddy used to always say? Do you know how many pockets are in on a corpse when they, uh, when they put them into the ground? How many pockets? How many pockets do they have? Uh, let's say if they wear with a suit. To none, you none. can't take you can't take any of the money with you. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <he's saying. laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, can't take the house, can't take the car, can't, can't take, take the Prada shoes, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> can't take the Prada <laughs> shoes. No, and 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 it was true. He's been saying that for years. But afterwards, like when my dad passed away, it kind of like started to click in a little bit, right? You hear yeah. all these cliches and things like that people say, and then you're like, it's funny how you kind of sit back and you think about it, and you're like, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's right. Let's do this and. You know, so I, I I try to look look at it that way. Like, what is my legacy? What's your legacy? Like, what do you want to be left behind knowing that? So they, like, man, honestly, you're so young, man. You know, I look at you and you're so young. It's like, it's hard, right? At yeah. your age, I wouldn't even know what I would say. I'm like, but what would you think your legacy would be? My legacy? Man. Have 100 kids? No, not 50 even. different moms, you know, is that what you're looking at? <laughs> <laughs> start, yeah, start. baby daddy. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to have legacies in multiple different things. I think when I think about my career, I want to know, be known as someone who builds things that really helped people out, right? For example, with what Alex and I are doing by building this media company is that we're looking to inspire people through great content that's going to educate them that could make an impact in their life. Maybe if it's two, 10 people, 15 people and say, you know what? When you guys built the hustle of everything brand and I used to tune in, like you brought these people in there that really spurred my business and you made an impact. So when I go to bed and I think about if we did not make that action of doing this thing, that person could not have had this, 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 and that. So I see my life and my legacy as a lot of domino effects of the things that I'm doing by doing one thing. So if it's this media company, it's going to create a lot of opportunities for people to have jobs, to learn from us and to really just 
lift up. That's what we call uplift, right? We want to uplift people in whatever they do. And it's beautiful. Yeah, they're my family too, right? Um, I want to be known as a great brother, a great son, great husband to the woman I'm going to marry one day. So, and I just want to be known as like, yeah, you know, there's a thing that I used to look at my dad and he's just like, I'm like, yeah, that's my dad. You know, that feeling, like I can imagine him saying that from my brothers and sisters. I want to have that one day and be like, you know, my dad was a great man. He did this, 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 and this. My son was a great son to me. He took care of us. He did that. That's legacy to me. Mm -hmm. um, money, you'll make the money. But as long as you got the things that you're taking care of, mm -hmm. what do people say about you? How do they make, how, how, how do they feel when yeah. your name is brought up? Well, it's, it's funny you say that too. And it's like, when I look back when I was maybe a little younger than you, our legacy, your legacy changes, right? Like, it's like we were all about playing hockey. And that's all your, your focus was. Mm -hmm. If you had told me I was 24, 25, that, you know, my legacy would want to be like, you know, being able to help people. I'm like, <laughs> if you like go screw yourself. Like, like, all you're worried about that age is yourself, right? So it's like, pucks. That's trying like, to stop pucks. Just trying to stop pucks. I want, I want to be known as one of the best goalies or something like too. And like, that was, that's what I thought my legacy was, mm -hmm. right? And just like in reality, like, it's so short sighted at it's that point. It's such a small, small blip in your life. So funny. Like we had this conversation the other day. Like my mom is going to be moving in a couple of years. We bought her, uh, we, she bought it, but I, I helped her uh, get into a pre-construction condo across the street from mm -hmm. where we currently are living. And she lives in Woodbridge at the, uh, the moment uh, in a big house with her and my brother. And uh, I still have a room. I only, even only lived there a couple of years. I still have in my room uh, trophies from what I was, when I was a goalie and you know, one of the goalie. One, and I had these, the, uh, some of these trophies are, there's three really big trophies we have there. And one of them was when the All Ontario's in uh, 1994, I got to a top goaltender. And then for the Nationals, the next year I got MVP and I got top goalie. Okay, great. This is 1995. What year are we in now? 2023. Long time ago, right? Yes. And my mom says, like, what are you going to do with those trophies? Like, I'm like, when, when we move, I'm like, toss them out. I don't give a shit. Oh, but oh my God, that's like your legacy. Like she's worried about what these trophies represented and how good I was back then. I'm like, mom, I haven't, I, I moved out of the house. Like I literally lived there for a couple of months. I moved out. I've been with Natalie since 2008, like March. I'm like, it's been a long time. So I'm like, do you think I really need that? That's not who I am anymore. It's like, I don't give a shit what you do with my trophies. It's like, I don't even, I don't even associate myself as like a hockey player anymore because it's been so far removed. Mm -hmm. But it's just like the mentality is like, well, that's what she remembers me as. And it's like, that would be like, like her like, moments of glory. Yeah. yeah. Which now I don't, you know, if you ask me like some of my highlights of my life, that's not even in my, the hockey's not even in my top 10, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's, I'm so far removed from it. So right now I, you just turned a new chapter. The 94, how, how old were you then? Like 20? No, 94. I was born 20. I was going to say, holy cow. So I was uh, like 15. So I was born 1978. Okay. So I was like, what, uh, 16? 16. Okay. 16. Um, that was a part of 20. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> 16 years old that time you're still david chinawi right that was a different era of david chinawi right now you could be saying this same thing at 45 and let's say when you're 70 and you're looking back at 45 and the things you accomplished now so like the royal page signature top real estate and everything right i hope so those I hope things those things matter to you right now so the way you're talking about it right now and when you turn 70 75 there'll be other things and then when i ask you in the same dc talks podcast episode 800 whatever like, eight thousand eight million eight, whatever <laughs> you'd be like yeah like those trophies they don't even matter anymore like that, i don't associate with myself anymore so do you consider your legacy as the moment you are in that time or are the things you've been really notice my, to define your era but my definition of my legacy has nothing to do with but what trophies. People, but so people, no, notice about how it's changed. So that's what you asked. My legacy was. It's like how I help people and like how, and how I was there for them. Never too. That will continue to grow and help. That I, that I don't think that's going to change. I think that's more my model. I think that would be it. Whereas maybe what I was saying when I was younger, it was tied in with those kinds of you know accomplishments and who I was and what you know where your social status was, etc. Now that I'm at 45 and I'm like, right. So at 70, I don't know what other status feels like. Maybe it's even. Maybe it might be a man of God or something. Who knows? I don't know. But I'm hoping it's constantly evolving as we are, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and 
figuring those kinds of stuff. So, so yeah, I'm like a hundred percent, it's going to change. And I'm like, hopefully the legacy gets better. <laughs> you but know? you don't want the highlights to define you. That's what you're trying Hell to say. Hell no. Yeah. yeah no. Like, like even, even, even when, when I say now, like I only really talk about my awards to other people when I'm having a listening presentation to show my pedigree of where I've been. It's not there to, and I've never used it to pat myself on the shoulder. I don't do that. I don't think, I don't say like, oh, I put on a card, I put it over there and I give it to people. Whatever. It's like, it just so, so you know where, what I've done. So if people ask, it's like, well, what does this mean? I'm like, well, this means I was top 2% nationally for X amount of years. You know, this means I did this, you know, like, so when you're comparing myself to other realtors, this is kind of the difference of what you get. Mm-hmm. And that's more of comparative. And if you, if you haven't sat through the listening presentation with me, but Julia has, and it's like, I have a slide. It kind of talks about myself versus competition, what we've done. But people that don't know me, like, want to know that kind of stuff, right? So they're like, okay, how do you compare against your competition? That's why we put it in there. But it's not like, and I literally like, well, this is the word of God. It means this. And here's the next one. And, and then gone. I never come back to it. I'm like, wow, remember I told you I was a top realtor in uh, 2021. I was number 10 in the, in the for Royal Page in Ontario. No, that was like one slide. That was like 15 slides ago. Mm-hmm. That's passed. Let's mm-hmm. go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even when you think about uh, greatness, people who've like accomplished great things in sports, Oscars, like you're only as good as your last performance. I don't know who quoted that, but you're um, only as good as your last performance. Like people don't remember the things that you did before. So mm-hmm. I respect that, DC. You work hard to get the accolades going, but once you accomplish them, uh, it's next. on to the next. It's on to the next thing. Next. You know that quote by Tom Brady? It was like, oh, which uh, which Super Bowl is your favorite? The which next one. The, the next one. <laughs> Hopefully that guy retires. As much as I like the, the, what the GOAT has done, you know, like, I'm a Packer fan, so. Yeah, he's <laughs> Just, done, man. I think Rodgers is out, What's your favorite too. ring? The next one. What a G. What oh, a yeah. G. All right. Everyone, let us know what you think about this episode. You know, mm-hmm. what fears are plaguing you today? What are you doing to overcome those fears to really act with boldness and be courageous in everything that you're doing do you see any last words on how people can manage their fears yeah face them face them and realize no you have the power over them Mm -hmm. as opposed to them having power over you amazing well there you have it this is the dc talks podcast with david chinelli i'm your host ono sende agent double (laughs) o signing off and we'll see you in the next one have a great week everyone bye everybody